Well, good afternoon, everyone. So we've just uh, wrapped up two busy uh, days here at NATO, covering a very wide range of issues that face the alliance, including the future of our presence in Afghanistan, evolving threats from Russia and China, the COVID-19 pandemic, the climate crisis, and, uh, and, and I could go on. Uh, we had a very uh, broad, very full, very uh, uh, important agenda. Uh, we also focused critically on the future uh, of NATO, uh, what work we must do to ensure that uh, the alliance remains strong and effective for decades to come. And we laid the groundwork for the upcoming leader-level summit, where even more work will be done to strengthen the alliance and chart a unified path forward uh, against the threats of our time. NATO has been the cornerstone of transatlantic security for more than 70 years. The United States is committed to this alliance now and in the future. And I came here to Brussels to consult with our allies because we intend to work with them and our partners wherever and whenever we can. Uh, we share collective security, strategic interests, a long history, people-to-people -people ties, and a commitment to core values, including democracy, human rights, the rule of law. In short, we're in this together. That's the spirit of Article 5. That's the spirit of the United States commitment to NATO. Um, let me just say on a personal note, I'm very happy to be back uh, in Brussels for my first visit as Secretary of State. Uh, I've been gratified by how our allies have welcomed America back to the table. Uh, we know that uh, our return is being met with high expectations. We welcome that. Uh, in a few hours, I'll have an opportunity to um, speak here at NATO uh, and go into greater depth about how the Biden administration will work with our allies and partners to advance our national security priorities around the world, so I invite you to stay tuned for that. Uh, but for now, let me just end by um, expressing uh, my personal gratitude and the gratitude of, uh, of the United States to Secretary General Stoltenberg and everyone here at NATO headquarters for hosting us this week uh, and doing it so well and so productively. Uh, and with that, happy to take a few questions. We'll start with Jennifer Hansler. Hi, Mr. Secretary. Have you relayed what you heard on Afghanistan to President Biden yet? What was his reaction? And you said yesterday that you would leave together when the time is right. Is now the right time? And what would have to change in the, about a month before May 1st to make it the right time to meet that deadline? So, you know, as you as you know, as we've discussed uh, already, we have this review underway. And I came here to do two things, uh, to share some of the thinking uh, that, uh, that we have uh, with our allies, but just as important to hear from them, to consult with them, uh, because that's what, we're, what allies do. And indeed, I relayed back uh, the views that I heard yesterday uh, from, uh, from our allies to the president. And I think that's going to be uh, an important factor in informing his thinking uh, about, uh, about the way forward. Um, we, we heard this the other week at the Defense Ministerial. Uh, we've heard this refrain as well this week, um, and it remains true. Uh, we went in together, uh, we uh, adjusted together, and when the time is right, uh, we will leave together. And the common theme, as I noted the other day, is, is together, and that was re-emphasized in, uh, in our meetings uh, here this week. Um, again, uh, last week the, the President noted it would be tough uh, to meet the, the May 1 deadline for a full withdrawal, uh, but whatever uh, we end up doing, um, again, is going to be informed by the thinking of our allies and uh, tactical decisions aside, we're united with those allies in, uh, in a few things, in, in making sure that um, we, as we move forward, we seek to bring a responsible end uh, to the conflict, to remove our troops from, from harm's way, uh, and uh, to ensure that Afghanistan can never again become a haven uh, for terrorists that would threaten the United States or uh, any of our allies. So we're in very close consultation, very close coordination with our allies and partners. That was reinforced over the last um, uh, 24 hours. And uh, again, I think this will be extremely helpful in informing the, the President's thinking as we go forward. We'll go to Steve Erlinger, New York Times. Hey, Steve. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good to, um, see good to see you. You just had a long discussion about Russia, and there are lots of things I wanted to ask you, but what I'm going to ask you is, do you agree now, without an INF treaty in place, that there's a real nuclear vulnerability in Europe to Russian INF and even tactical nuclear weapons? And if you do, what's the right answer? And if you don't, does it mean that NATO still needs German nuclear sharing, which is becoming increasingly controversial there? Thank you. Well, let me say this. We had a, a couple of things. We had a um, lengthy discussion about uh, Russia this morning uh, with, uh, with our colleagues. And uh, before getting to the specific question, I think a few things stood out. Um, <laughs> I think we all expect our relationship with Russia to remain a challenge uh, into the foreseeable future, um, but it's one that we're, uh, we're prepared for. Uh, and ultimately, uh, I think what we can hope is to have a relationship with Russia that is at least predictable uh, and stable. Um, and so given that, uh, our intent is to uh, engage Russia uh, in ways that advance our interests while remaining very clear-eyed about the challenges that, that it poses. So even as we work with Russia to advance our interests and advance alliance interests, uh, we'll also work to hold Russia to account for its uh, reckless and adversarial actions. Um, I think we've already demonstrated that, uh, particularly with the extension of New START uh, for five years, but also with the actions we've already taken to, uh, uh, to hold Russia to account. But one of the areas where I think we... Um, we have a clear mutual interest in uh, seeing if we can work together is on strategic stability to include um, all of Russia's uh, nuclear weapon systems, uh, including um, those that may not be covered uh, by New START. Uh, and I think that's um, clearly in the interest of the United States, uh, in the interest of our allies, and I can't speak for Russia, in Russia's interest too. So, Steve, that's uh, what we'll be looking at when, when, the, when President Biden spoke to President Putin. Uh, they both did note uh, the, uh, the possibilities of um, exploring beyond the extension of New START uh, where we might go on strategic stability. And again, that would have to uh, encompass all of uh, the, uh, the systems that Russia possesses. Go to Dan Michaels. Uh, Dan Michaels with the Wall Street Journal. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, first, if I could just quickly follow up on Afghanistan. Can you say what you've told your NATO allies about the timing of the administration's review, and what if the Taliban doesn't agree to an extension of the timeline? And, and, and second, if I may, quickly, it's clear that the atmospherics here have improved. Are you at all concerned that allies will take that as a leeway to be a bit more relaxed about meeting some of the commitments that they've faced a lot of pressure on over the past four years? Thank you very much. So thank you, Dan. Um, look, I don't want to get into hypotheticals about uh, what the Taliban may or may not do, what we, we may or may not do. Uh, this is a very uh, active uh, review. And again, as I said, it's, 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 it's now fully informed by the views of our allies. And that was really what our goal was uh, coming here, to make sure that we, we, we could do that. Um, as you know as well, uh, the diplomacy on Afghanistan uh, has been moving forward, uh, even as we've been reviewing uh, the, the, the question of the uh, May 1 deadline. Uh, we saw a, I think, very productive meeting in Moscow uh, with the, the so-called uh, Troika plus one, uh, Russia, China, Pakistan, the United States. Um, the statement that came out uh, from that, that meeting, I think, is... Um, uh, is important and significant in underscoring the view of all four countries that it was important for the, uh, the parties to accelerate their efforts uh, at uh, finding a peaceful resolution to the conflict in Afghanistan, uh, important that there be a reduction in violence, uh, a clear rejection of uh, the establishment or reestablishment of, of an emirate uh, in Afghanistan. So there is a, uh, a lot of common denominators among these four countries, which uh, otherwise uh, occasionally have their differences. So I think that's significant. And we're also uh, tracking to uh, a meeting hosted uh, by Turkey in the coming weeks that would bring together leadership of the, uh, the Afghan government uh, and the Taliban, 
uh, again, in, uh, in an effort to advance uh, on the diplomacy and to advance toward uh, some kind of agreement uh, for a peaceful uh, political resolution uh, of the conflict. So all of that is, um, is moving forward. Uh, you're right that um, I think we found a very positive reception here from, from allies and partners. Um, so I'll take that for, uh, for, for today and for this week. <laughs> that, may not, that may not last forever, but in all, in, in all seriousness, it was, it was extremely gratifying. Uh, but again, I think it starts with the fact that uh, we expressed very clearly, and I expressed very clearly on behalf of President Biden, our commitment to this alliance and our determination to um, engage, to consult, to listen, to work together with our, uh, with our allies. Um, but we also discussed in, in some detail uh, the need not only to um, uh, look at what NATO has to do to make sure uh, it is engaged on the challenges of our time, not just the time the, the alliance is founded, we also discussed the need to properly resource that. Uh, and uh, certainly, uh, we uh, believe strongly, uh, the United States believes strongly that we, we do need to do that. Uh, allies made commitments uh, at the Wales summit in 2014 that, uh, in fact, they're making uh, good progress on. But um, there are other aspects to this that are, that are important. Uh, the, the financial commitments are significant. They're, ver they're vital. They're important. And we, we're determined uh, that uh, we all see them through together. Um, but there are also important questions of uh, readiness uh, of our forces. There are important uh, questions of uh, our ability to uh, actually uh, raise the necessary forces for particular missions. Those are vital things too. And, and finally, um, Dan, I would say that uh, we also recognize that uh, while it's very important that we um, remain true to the commitments that we all made as allies in 2014 in Wales, um, it's also true that um, different allies and, and partners who are not allies contribute to our security um, defined largely in, in, in many ways. And it's important, I think, for the United States to recognize that too. Uh, for example, um, development uh, assistance is uh, a vital part of, uh, of security. And a number of, uh, of our allies, a number of our partners make very significant uh, per capita contributions uh, to, to development. And so that's, um, uh, that's something we don't want to lose sight of either. We'll get to Terry Schultz. Hello, Mr. Secretary, up here. Oh. Terry Schultz for NPR. Thank you very much. Um, despite the uh, improved atmosphere, there are still some pretty significant areas where the U.S. and its European allies and its partners at the EU are on different pages, um, specifically on China. Um, the Biden administration, before it was in office, um, sent out signals that they would like to see the EU wait on its investment deal, and uh, that didn't happen. And you'll be speaking with um, Ursula von der Leyen and uh, uh, Joseph Burrell uh, later. Um, are you hoping to pull them more toward the U.S. view that they should not be doing business with China at, to the extent that European governments are? Are at the moment? Are you concerned about this? And the other issue is Iran. The E3 would very much like to see you and Iran sit down. There was an invitation. I understand that the U.S. says it's waiting for Iran to make the first move. Iran says it's waiting for you to make the first move. I mean, why can't you come to an agreement to sit down and talk on this? What's, what, what's, what's the holdup? Thanks. Good. Thank you. Uh, so first, with regard to, uh, to the EU and particularly uh, China, um, you're right, I have the opportunity actually this afternoon uh, to, uh, to sit down with our, our, our very close partners uh, and uh, the leadership. Maybe more important than that, uh, President Biden is going to be speaking uh, to the council uh, tomorrow uh, via, uh, via video. Uh, all, both uh, important, and especially the president, uh, important evidence uh, of our commitment to work closely with the European Union. We see the European Union as a partner of first resort on a broad uh, array of issues. And, uh, and China is one of them. Um, we uh, are looking very much forward to actually um, having uh, close consultations uh, between the United States and uh, the EU uh, on China. Uh, that'll be an opportunity to uh, share the concerns that, uh, uh, that we have, uh, including those related to trade, uh, investment, human rights, 
Um, and indeed, uh, I'll have an opportunity to do that this afternoon uh, with, uh, with my counterparts. With regards to the um, uh, comprehensive agreement uh, on investment, uh, our judgment is that uh, the onus is really going to be on China uh, to demonstrate um, that the pledges it's made on forced labor, on state-owned enterprises, on subsidies uh, are not just talk, uh, and that the Chinese government will follow through on the commitments uh, that it's made. Uh, so I suspect that uh, not only will we be looking to that, but uh, so will uh, the European Union. Um, but we'll also continue to engage with uh, European counterparts, including members of the European Parliament, uh, on how to advance our shared economic uh, interests and to counter some of China's aggressive and uh, coercive actions, as well as its failures, uh, at least in the past, to uphold its, uh, its international commitments. And I think, uh, again, what's so important, uh, both with regard to, to NATO and the issues we're dealing with, but also uh, the EU and our partnership with, uh, with the EU, is that um, when we are working together, when we are speaking with one voice, uh, when we're acting together, uh, we are much stronger and, and much more effective than if any single one of us is doing it uh, alone. And so, for example, when it comes to uh, dealing with some of China's practices in the commercial area and the trade and investment and economic area that we all object to, if the United States is taking those on uh, on its own, we're about 25 percent of world GDP. When we're actually working with our European partners, uh, Asian partners, and uh, and others, we might be 40, 50, or 60 percent of world GDP. Uh, that's a lot harder for Beijing to. Um, uh, to ignore. So uh, that's another reason why we are really uh, uh, focusing on uh, revitalizing, recommitting to our uh, alliances and partnerships. Um, so with regard to, uh, to Iran, um, we have been very clear that um, the path to diplomacy uh, is open. And as you noted, uh, when the EU suggested bringing together uh, all of the participants in the, uh, in the JCPOA uh, to look at how uh, we might come back to, uh, to compliance with the JCPOA, we, we, uh, we said yes, and, and to date, Iran uh, has chosen not to engage. Uh, so, uh, as we've said, the ball is really in their court uh, to see if they want to take the path to diplomacy and returning to compliance with uh, the agreement. And uh, should, that, should that happen? Um, we would uh, then seek, as we said, to build a, a longer and stronger agreement, but also to engage on some of the uh, other issues where uh, Iran's actions and conduct are, uh, are particularly pro problematic, uh, destabilization of uh, countries in the region, ballistic missile program, uh, et cetera. Um, so I had a meeting last night with um, our E3 uh, partners, with, uh, with the UK, with Germany and France. We are all very much on the same page. Uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to Iran, uh, when it comes to our common uh, interest in um, uh, seeing if Iran wants to engage in diplomacy uh, to come back fully into compliance with its obligations under the JCPOA, um, we are again prepared to engage on that. To date, uh, Iran has not been, uh, but let's see what uh, what happens in the weeks ahead. Let's take a final question from Robin Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Robin Emmett from Reuters. Um, you said yesterday that you had a bilateral with Germany's um, foreign minister, Heiko Maas, um, and I wanted to ask you about Nord Stream. Um, so the pipeline is almost complete. I wondered what you see as the solution in this issue, uh, because uh, Ambassador Ischinger has put forward this idea that construction could actually be completed, but there would be some kind of kill switch whereby gas could always be shut off if, say, Russia moved against Ukraine. So I wondered, first of all, was that discussed uh, yesterday between you and yourself uh, um, and, and Heiko Maas? Mm -hmm. And if not, what is a solution? Thank you. Well, first let me say that uh, Germany is among our closest allies. And um, we have a real disagreement on Nord Stream 2. That's not a secret to anyone. But uh, we're not going to let that stand in the way of the work we're doing together on issue after issue uh, that is of direct concern to the citizens of both of our countries. Uh, and indeed, uh, I've had great conversations with uh, 
uh, with Heiko Maas uh, and, and German colleagues about the uh, agenda that we have together, both uh, uh, as partners ourselves uh, through NATO, uh, the EU, uh, <laughs> at the UN, uh, you name it. Um, but uh, it's also true that uh, President Biden has been very clear for a long time in his view that uh, Nord Stream 2 is, um, is a bad idea. And I reiterated that view uh, directly to, uh, to Foreign Minister Maas. Um, and I also made clear that firms engaged in pipeline construction risk uh, U.S. sanctions. Uh, the pipeline divides Europe. Uh, it exposes Ukraine uh, and Central Europe to Russian manipulation and coercion. Uh, it goes against Europe's own stated energy uh, security goals. So what, uh, uh, what I said was that uh, we will continue to monitor uh, activity to complete or, uh, or certify the pipeline. And if that activity takes place, we'll make a determination on the applicability of sanctions. And uh, this was, I think, you know, useful as well for me to have an opportunity to discuss directly with uh, Foreign Minister Maas, just to make clear our position and to make sure that there's no, uh, no ambiguity, and that's exactly what, uh, what I did. Thank you very Thank much, you. everyone. Thanks very much.